So, Paul, firstly, thanks for inviting us into Bethnal Green Ventures. You're quite welcome. <laughs> Let's start with some nice agenda-setting questions. Who are Bethnal Green Ventures? Uh, so, we're an early-stage investment fund. Um, we focus on investing in what we call tech-for-good businesses. So, those are businesses that are trying to deliberately achieve a positive social change as well as be high growth valuable businesses and we, we, we love to invest in them at what most people call a pre-seed stage so that's typically when they've got a prototype of a product and a team of a two three four people um, but lots of ambition and lots of uh, drive to make a positive change in the world but also build something that, that loads of people use. Whilst I imagine most people who've decided to watch this probably have a fairly good understanding of the industry. Let's suppose someone has stumbled across it and they don't. When we talk about early stage, what are we really talking about? So early stage is, is usually before you've started making money. So as a business, you, you probably um, got something that you can show to potential investors and potential customers, but you, you probably aren't generating a lot of revenue yet. Uh, you're still working out what kind of company you are to some extent, and you'd certainly be a very small team. So you typically just the founders of the business, not, not even any employees yet. Um, and that's the stage where we like investing at that stage because there's still lots to work out. We can get involved, we can help them to shape uh, their, the, the, the mission of the, of the company, the, uh, the, the product, all those kinds of things. And, and we really enjoy that, but it is risky. And yeah. that's, that's, that's the element that I think a lot of people look at this and go, oh, you know, that's not making any money yet, why are you investing in it? But we're, look, we're investing for, you know, 10 years. We, 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 we expect to hold our investments for eight to 10 years uh, before, we, before we might sell them on. So when we're talking about impact investment, what, what do we really mean? Impact investment is when you're trying to invest in businesses that are going to deliberately have a positive social and environmental impact as well as being profitable businesses. Um, and not just deliberately trying to do that, so sort of mission-driven businesses, but you're going to do that in a way that's measurable. So they're going to be able to demonstrate and prove to people that as well as having you know, a profit, they, they've had a positive impact on the world. So look, um, I, I suppose that then, given what you said about businesses who are trying to do some good, bleeds into your investment values. But when we were prepping for this interview, and I talked to a few people across the industry, hey, what would you ask of a, of a VC fund? One of the things that, that people suggested was to ask what your investment values are. So it would be great to kind of explore those in a bit of detail. Yeah, it's interesting. I th so for us, the, the aspect of like diversity isn't really about doing good. This <laughs> it's, it's, it's more that for us, it just completely makes sense that the best founders of businesses that are trying to have a you know, positive impact on the world are going to come from a whole range of backgrounds. They're, they're not just going to be one type of, of person. And so we've always looked for a diverse range of founders to back because we believe they just build better businesses in, in that way. And we've always tried to have a diverse team at BGV as well because we think diverse teams make better investment decisions. So for us, actually, the, the diversity side of things hasn't been because we're for good. It's just been because we think that's a better way of doing business. And that, I think, is... It, it's it's not so much about uh, our values. It's more that that's like a it's a performance good point. business. It's, sense. it's just good business sense to to invest in diverse founders and founders that potentially are overlooked by other investors. But to some extent, we can't quite see why. You know, why <laughs> why are people ignored women founders? Why have people ignored like people from ethnic minorities and so on? To us, it doesn't make sense because like we know they can make they can build great businesses and actually they've got these unique perspectives that maybe help them to build better businesses than any anybody else. So the diversity side of what we've done at, at BGV has come from uh, a strategy point, if you like, to yeah. r almost more than a values point. I suppose then it, it begs the question of how you find those people. And I suppose that's the, the question behind how you deal source, right? Yeah. So we have a bit of an unusual deal sourcing strategy for the venture capital world um, in that you do, we, we often describe it as like no warm intro needed. You, you don't need to know somebody who knows BGV in order to, to, to approach us. We have a completely open application process for investment from BGV. And so um, that means that our deal sourcing strategy is as much kind of outbound, if you like, as it is you know, inbound referrals. And um, that makes us a bit different. And I, and I hope means that people feel that we're more approachable if you're not from the usual suspects of, you know, sort of startup white guy um, that, that, that we've seen in, in 
in the, in the industry, unfortunately, over the last 10 years. But look, this isn't, this isn't a hatchet job on VC funds. That's not the point of this. But implied in, in your answer there is a critique of how some firms are going about deal sourcing in that it isn't outbound. Historically, it hasn't been. So, you know, venture capital uh, was a very closed shop. And, and, you know, even even in the US, you know, it, it was about referrals from your your sort of business contacts or your university contacts. It was very much, it, you know, a lot of venture capital firms um, had no public face at all. You know, they, they, people didn't even know they existed until uh, until relatively recently. It's only that uh, with the power of the industry and scrutiny of it that it's become come more out into the open. So there's still a bit of that legacy in the industry. It's like, well, we, do, we sort of do things a little bit like, you know, through our own little black books. And I think opening it up and being open about the fact mm -hmm. you know, like we want to invest in the best founders. That means people need to know about us. That's actually quite a new thing. Um, but there's still that legacy of it being a closed shop that, that we're fighting against in the industry more widely. Is saying there's a bit of leg legacy understating it slightly? Well, I mean, yeah, <laughs> statistically it is. We're still at the point where we think that only about two pence in the pound of UK venture capital is going to like all female founding teams, for example, which is just ridiculous. And, um, you know, that's, that, that needs to move on. I think the, the culture of it is improving too slowly, but... Um, yeah, I think it's, it is gradually improving, but we're still like way behind where we should be. We'll put a pin in that. We'll, we'll maybe come back to it later because I think it's an interesting point. But when, when you do meet a founder, it doesn't matter whether they're male or female at this point, but when you meet a founder and you're assessing the potential return and what you're looking for, what is it about that person that you're looking to see? So uh, often for us, we're actually looking for a co-founding team. So we, we prefer to back te teams rather than individuals. Um, that's not to say that the individuals aren't important, but we, we, we've, we found that there is a higher propensity for success when you've got a team of two or three people who are starting a business and who can like, support each other, to be honest. It's, it's, that's really important. But what we're looking for, because we invest so early on, is almost for them to teach us something about the problem they're trying to solve. So, you know, we all know that, um, let's say, um, diabetes is, is a problem. But when we meet the founders who say we're trying to start a business that's a, a addressing diabetes, we almost want them to teach us something about the problem we didn't know. So for them to have some unique insight into the problem, to be able to tell us something about it, that means that um, we've got confidence in their knowledge of a, and uh, ability to solve that problem. And that, that's a really important part of it for us. But then also we're looking for their ambition, like their, their yeah, almost sort of comfort with the idea of building something really big because uh, it's not for everybody. It's, it's really hard work and that, that's what we're looking for in, in those teams. You, you mentioned that the businesses that you're backing, by their very nature, there's an element of risk. Now, Bethel Green Ventures, you are four women and two men, right? However, there's been lots of studies um, that suggest that uh, when you're sat down and a VC is talking during a pitch to a founder that if the founder is female they are more likely to, uh, to ask questions that are slightly negative in their outlook and if they're talking to male founders the questions could be more positive in their outlook and it doesn't seem to matter whether the VC is necessarily male or female. How do you guard against that? Is that something you're conscious of? Yeah, uh, very conscious of it and, and what we've tried to do is to think about the way that people interact with us b before they invest as a system with lots of stages in it that hopefully have checks and balances to that. So uh, it's not just based on like one meeting with us. You know, we, we've got um, people have a, a written application in which they can shine or not in one, one, one way or another. They will probably meet us before they do that. You know, th there's, there's lots of different ways that they interact with us over time. And it's, they will meet lots of different people from our team and from our network and so on. So we've tried to uh, shield against, you know, bias coming up in any one particular situation that would influence our investment decision. So from, from talking to the founders, the female founders that we've been speaking to, there seems to be um, an acceptance that actually at this early stage, it is reasonably easy to find a meeting with a, with a, with a VC fund and perhaps raise. Mm. But the problems seem to happen as it comes further down the line, maybe B, C, D rounds. Why do you think that is? 
Yeah, it's, it, the, our data bears that out and that we, we see the diversity of our portfolio is very good at the early stages, partly because that's where, you know, where, we, where we've backed them. But as it gets beyond BGV, we don't make later stage investor investments, um, diversity of, of the portfolio goes down. And um, so some ways you could say, oh, well, we're just going to blame that on <laughs> the venture capital industry who comes in after us. And I think there is an element of um, they're making larger, but you know, a smaller number of, of bets. And so it's more accentuated at that stage. There is a particular systemic bias problem, I think, in the slightly later stage venture capital market, uh, which is, is something that we've got to address. It's, it, f- it feels unnecessarily unkind to perhaps point the finger at individual firms, if that's the case. So what else could help? I mean, what, what could government or what could bodies working with government try and do to create an environment where some of those pressures are eased and, and we do seem, see better results at latter stages? So if, for me, it's not just one thing that we need to do. I think it, we need to sh- sort of shift the system, if you like, uh, in order to make it sustainable and to make it last. And I think the thing that everybody could do is is put more pressure on getting the the actual real statistics out there so um, i would certainly encourage founders to ask firms that they're talking to about investment for their diversity and inclusion statistics some of them will have never been asked that before (laughs) but if you're if you're being asked that by founders it's genuine that's genuinely like oh hang on that's something we need we need to have we need we need to work that out um, certainly, what generally known as the LPs, the limited partners in, in funds, so the people who invest in the funds themselves, already starting to see more of them ask for diversity and inclusion statistics. But I want to see more of that. I want to see like them routinely asking as part of their decision making process as to which funds they invest in, like saying, OK, show us your diversity statistics, both of your team and of your portfolio. What's driving that new level of interest from, from those in- individuals? So I think it's that they're they're under pressure from some of their stakeholders as well. So you know some of those the investors in uh, venture capital are um, you know they're, uh, they're they're public companies themselves. So they want to report on like the diversity themselves. Others, it's actually um, there's there's a bit of a transfer of wealth going on between uh, in what are you know called family offices which are basically you know the, the the wealth of very wealthy people where it's that the wealth is moving down a generation and the generation below cares more about this stuff potentially than the than the, the generation that came before them so so that's putting pressure on on those those um on firms that way as well and it's not across the board yet but i'd like to see it you know just just routinely part of the decision making process uh, that they ask for that those statistics the final piece is in the UK is that you know, government plays a really strong role in the venture capital industry, both as a, an investor in funds, but also because we have these tax reliefs called SEIS and EIS and VCT, I'm not sure, all acronyms, but it means that the government has a bit of control over what data those companies that use those tax reliefs must share. I think it'd be great if they basically forced those companies to release their diversity and inclusion data. Is it a bit simplistic of me to think that perhaps this is less about gender and more about class to a degree? Yeah, so I think it would, the, the, the venture capital industry has, I would say, a diversity and inclusion problem, not just a gender problem. Um, certainly you see that there are uh, lots of groups of people who are overlooked for funding. Um, and that comes... Um, Again, from my point of view, I think that's just very short-sighted of the industry more more widely. But it is it is definitely a, a problem that goes wider than gender. It's you know class, educational background, like all kinds of things feed into the decision making process of of VC firms, um, and we need to challenge that. Look, this is a hugely complicated picture with a lot of moving parts. That's been clear throughout the course of this conversation. And I know it's really hard to boil it down to one or two actionable things that we can kind of try and take away. But there would seem to be um, a direction of, of consensus that more scrutiny, more openness and transparency around data could lead to some kind of actionable outcome. What, I don't know whether, whether you'd agree with that, but what would you say 
could be one or two things that could change and positively change the outcome for female founders. Yes, I, I agree that the data is a really big part of it. We're doing this, basically we know it's bad. We don't know exactly how bad, if we're honest, in terms of the data at the moment. So it'd be much better to have stronger data and also to have data at the firm level so we can compare and contrast different firms and what's their performance on this. Um, and actually one thing that, you know, venture capitalists are a really competitive bunch. And if you start to get that data out, they'll start to try and outcompete each other a little bit on this, I think. And that, that would be a very good thing. Um, but also, yeah, the, the scrutiny, like if, if people do have um, like bad stories about particular firms and the way that they feel they've been treated because of their background, then there are ways that you can like you know, bring that to the fore now. There's, um, you know, there's, there's, there's ways that I think we can, um, to some extent, call out bad behaviour in this in a way that probably wasn't, people didn't feel was possible a few years ago. Um, and I think we, we need to see more of that. Paul? Thank you very much for your time today. Some really interesting points and, and I really appreciate you taking the time to invite us in and uh, to have the conversation. No problem.